All right, guys, today what we're doing is we're down underneath this uh, Suburban and we're seeing that the half shaft axle boot right here on the constant velocity joint on the outboard side is broken. And so what we're going to be doing today is we're going to pull on the shaft off so we can do a reboot kit and I'll show you how to do a reboot kit on one of these half shafts. All right, guys, the first thing we got to do is remove the wheel and the tire. So you're going to take off these 22 millimeter lug nuts. Sometimes these wheels can get rusted on there. Just take a mallet. Rubber mallet will take care of that problem. That's even with having some anti-seize on here. So if we take a look in here from the top, get a better view of what we're going to be repairing here, right? So we can see where this is just completely separated. And hopefully we've caught it in time. Notice this while doing an oil change. So the first thing we're going to do to separate this is we're going to start taking these 15 millimeter bolts here in the back off. As we do each one, we'll be able to rotate it around until we get them all. Let's like find a place for this to stay. So that's all you're going to do is just go around and take each one of these off. I'm just using a 15 millimeter impact socket on a wobble. So let me get all these off and we'll come back. All right, we got the last one up here. Bring this down. This guy I'm not actually going to remove. I'm just going to loosen him up. Then what I'm going to do is take this axle nut off. I like to do the axle nut after so that we can shake loose the uh, corrosion that might be holding that back piece on. So we're going to take off with a 36 millimeter socket. And just to make sure that we're loosened up here, I'm just going to give it a couple of taps just to make sure. All right, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and remove that last one that we left up there. All right, so we've got the axle nut off, and we've got the six nuts that are holding the rear flange on. Sari, let me just see if this guy's going to come loose for us. Pretty sure we got all these bolts off. Yep, he's just on there super tight. This is the original shaft from 1999. All right going to have to get me some other kind of a tool to get up in there and prize in there. So we'll come right, back guys, in a minute. Guys, what I ended up finding I had to do, because this thing has been on here for so long since it was first assembled, I had to take a small little chisel here to use it as a wedge to get between the flange of the half shaft and the flange of the transaxle here. When you turn this thing around, you'll notice that some of these, you might have a small gap. Let me see if I can turn it around here. I mean, you might find something that looks like this, where you have a small gap. 
And then just get yourself a three or four pound hammer and give it a couple of whacks, you know, and it'll get under there. But at this point, we've got this loose now. I think we just got it still holding on a little bit right there. All right, so we've got this separated. We're gonna have to clean up all this corrosion in here. That's what helped make it difficult to get yes. off. Uh, normally with a half ton truck, you can get away with just taking the shock out. But this three quarter ton type truck, looks like I'm gonna have to take the stabilizer link for the stabilizer bar off instead. The problem is that we can't get this uh, piece here off. It would be nice to be able to get it over this way. And this is directly in the way of being able to do that. So I'm pretty sure if we remove this, then we'll have the clearance we need to clear this out. So I'm going to take a 13 millimeter on a breaker bar, put it on the bottom of this link, and then I would come up on top with a 13 millimeter socket. And we're going to see if we can get this guy off. All right, sorry about that, bumping the camera, but yep, we got this off the bottom. Fortunately, this was replaced not that long ago. So I think that we can get it out. What normally happens is these things get so rusty that you lose them trying to remove them. I'm going to see if I can drive it out without damaging it. We can reuse it. I'm using a, a brass drift here to avoid damaging the long bolt. Of course, it's all under tension from the other side. I think we'll be okay. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and keep working this out. You guys get the idea. We'll come back after we get this link on. All right, guys, we've got this stabilizer link out. And so now what we should be able to do, I put this back up on top of the flange area so we can see how it would start. Now we're just gonna rotate this around so that we can see this guy. Hopefully there's enough light here. Put some more light back there. Maybe we come down a little bit where you can actually see that flange. There you go. And then we can just rotate this guy off. And again, I'm just gonna keep moving the light around here, see if I can get the best view. So now we've got the axle shaft laying right where the stabilizer link was. And if we turn the wheel a couple more times, we just now, we've cleared it. Right. All right, so trying to move around a little bit here. So now we've gotten it out. If you can see in the front, you know, we pushed it through. And now what we're going to do is we're just going to run it up into this space above the skid plate. I'm hoping we're going to have to take this skid plate off. It's held on by 15 millimeter bolts. two in the front here. I believe there's two in the back. It's all right, with this out of the way, we finally have enough clearance to get this axle out. So let's lay it up on the bench and take a look at it. All right, guys, here it is. This is the half shaft. I got it out. <clears throat> We're going to have to get this corrosion off the end. That was part of why we couldn't get that off very easily. We don't have any damage to the inboard boot. So our damage is just on the outboard boot. And there's a specific boot kit that GM makes for either the outboard or the, in or, or the inboard version. Now, there's an outer clamp here that we need to get off. 
We know it's just a residual, but we need to get that off. And then the clamp on the band here is, is called a swage clamp. And that one doesn't have uh, any kind of visible crimp. The factory one is just a single piece. So what we're gonna have to do is got to cut that off right at the seam. And we're gonna be using a Dremel tool to do that. We're gonna go ahead and cut the one in the front off as well. All right, so that clamps off. And then we're gonna get this clamp here off. Just trying to find the original seam on it, make it a little easier. You definitely wanna be wearing eye protection when you do this part. And you definitely don't wanna go in past the clamp. And this is going to go real slow so that we don't go too far. Just trying to have a look at it and see how much further we've got here. I might be able to break it where it is now. Not sure, might need to do a little bit more, but you guys get the idea. We're just gonna keep working on this guy until we, well, there it is, it's enough. You just wanna go just enough to do what I just did. We didn't even cut through the rubber. And then by cutting this front one, get that guy off as well. And then we can break the, uh, the seal with the rubber. Kind of peel it back, you know, your, your break might be somewhere else rather than right here at the lip like this one is. And at this point, we can just break it off here. And I talk about breaking here, right? I'm talking about breaking the seal, not actually breaking anything. It's got a couple of different tools, flathead screwdriver, just something to get under here and get this rubber to let go from where it's been clinging to for 20 years. There we go. All right. You can see there's like a band of rust around this. This is part of what we're going to inspect, right? Because we want to just come in here and reboot this thing. But if it's damaged, then we might not be able to do that. All right. There's a ton of grease that we're going to need to clear out of the way. If you're the squeamish type, just, this is the kind of job that might get you going here. So what we're looking for is the side that has the snap ring. I think that's it right there. Just need to get a couple more paper towels, guys. But what we're going to do is we're going to clean that grease out of the way so that we can see that snap ring. And then we're going to use a snap ring plier 
to open that up so that we can separate the two pieces. And then we're going to need to get going on, you know, cleaning it out. All right, found some taper towels here. Just going to continue to clean this out so that we can see in here where our snap ring might be. I think that's it right there. So if you zoom in here, actually guys, I'm just gonna grab the flashlight here. Maybe it'll help you with this. Try to get a paper towel down in here. Get some of this old grease out. But there's our snap ring right there. Hopefully you guys can see it sitting in the groove of the shaft. And we're going to stick a pair of snap ring pliers in here. And we're going to open that up. So that we can separate these two pieces. Get the idea. So I'm going to push that apart so that I can pull this shaft out of this ball bearing joint end. All right, guys. So I stopped it right here at the end. So you can see we've got the uh, clamp opened up here. I'm just about to wiggle it the rest of the way off. All right. If you thought that was a pita, wait till you have to put it back together. All right, next thing we're gonna do, you now at this point, we can discard those uh, two clamps. We can discard this old boot. And what we're gonna need to do now is we're gonna need to put this guy in the parts washer and, and get it all cleaned up so we can inspect these ball bearings and, and make sure that they're okay. Now when we get back and we get ready to uh, put it all back together, and hopefully they, we find out they're okay, let me show you what we're gonna be replacing it with. Now you can still buy these outer boot kits from GM. It's a part 1586818, and it'll have the boot, both the small and the large clamps, and it'll be the kind of clamp that we took off of here, and, and, and some grease, pre-measured amount of grease to repack in here. But you can sometimes get the earlier part number cheaper, the discontinued part number, and that's a 260-62619. And the only difference between the two is this one doesn't include a new snap ring. And you need to replace the snap ring whenever you do this job. Uh, and so that part number is 260-56802. So if you pick this guy up, there'll be a snap ring inside. And if you pick this guy up, there's no snap ring. Instead, what you get inside of both of them is a new boot, a pack of pre-measured grease, you get an instruction kit, and you get a couple of clamps. And if you opened up the other one, you'd see the same thing, except there'd be a snap ring in there as well. So that's what the, we're gonna be replacing it with. And I'll put these part numbers in the description of the video as well, with links over to eBay and or Amazon, where you can pick them up. But for now, I'm gonna start cleaning everything up and we'll come back after we got everything clean so we can inspect it. All right, guys, we've got the, this side of the shaft prepared. We've got it cleaned off with mineral spirits. We've taken a wire wheel to the seal of the top part of the boot. And we've made sure that we've got no damage. There's no deep corrosion on any of the parts here. The reason this is all shiny is that broken piece of the rubber has just been rubbing on here for a long time. And that's why it looks like that. So we've cleaned up and inspected our other clamps. We've got a little bit of cosmetic corrosion on this swage clamp for this rear uh, boot here, but this rear boot is fine. And this whole thing never made any noise it was just that we caught this during an oil change, so I think we're fine there. And I've started wire brushing the inside flange area here. I've got a little bit more to go on that, but we want to take this back down to bare metal, and then we'll treat it with a rust preventative. So let's take a look at the other side. All right, guys, we've got this mounted in the vise with some soft teeth here so we don't damage the splines. We've already wire brushed around the bottom part of the boot, and now what we're doing is we're trying to do some disassembly on the bearings and races so that we can 
get them disassembled enough so we can clean inside. So I'm using a brass punch so that we don't damage anything. And basically what we're doing is we're going to do each of these balls one angle at a time after we have everything lined up. And just take a magnet and take them out. And we're just going to continue doing that till we get all six of the balls out. And that'll give us an ability to get some more solvent in here to clean this up. And again, you've got to use brass because you don't want to cause any damage to these races. In this case, this ball has wedged itself, so I'm going to have to try and get him back where he belongs. Get him back down at a different angle. They'll only come out when they're depressed in a certain position. All right, guys, just to take a view of the service manual, right? So we're doing the outer joint and seal replacement. This is kind of like a, a blow up of what we had, right? We have this assembly with the ball bearings in the race. We have this swage clamp. We had the boot and we had this other clamp on the end. And then we did this part here where we opened up the snap ring so that we could separate the, the two of these apart. And this was the part I was just showing you here where you use a, a brass punch and a drift or excuse me, a brass hammer and a, and, a, and a brass drift and you can move the race around so that you can get the, the alloy balls out to inspect them. And then the further uh, uh, sub-assembly is you can move the race into the right position so you can actually extract it. It actually comes out and goes back in in a certain um, direction. And then similarly here, here's the inner race. So you get an outer race, inner race, and the six balls. And that's all shown, you know, blown apart here. There's a deflector ring that goes on the outside of this assembly. And you've got the um, outer race, the inner race, the six balls, the snap ring, um, the swage clamp to the large side of the boot, the boot, and then the clamp on the uh, small side of the boot. So now we're going to start the reassembly. And we're going to pick it up um, with, with these pieces here. So these guys are talking about how they clamp this uh, on, this, this outer clamp, or inner clamp rather, the small one, on the boot. And it's basically a tool that has a breaker bar and a torsion type torque wrench. And they, this is how the dealer would do it, right? 100 foot pounds, and they'd crimp this. But what matters is the distance of the crimp and how it's closed. So this is the piece that you saw me cut off with the Dremel tool earlier. So we're just going to do that with a more DIY off-the-shelf kind of tool like this. This is a USA-made tool that I've had. I don't know who makes it. It's been a while since I've used it. But this is a tool that actually is used to crimp those um, types of clamps. And we're just going to make sure that we use our micrometer and we're going to check to make sure that we crimp it down to the 2.15 millimeter gap that it talks about. So let's go ahead and head over to the bench and work on that piece and then we'll assemble the bottom piece. All right, so we've got our shaft here, guys, and we're going to just uh, come over here and open up our parts kit. I'm going to, like I said, use the older version of the kit. So we're going to have to do our, our ring separately. I'm going to work this guy on to the outside of the boot. And then I'm going to slide our boot down. And what's important here is we want to get this, let me slide it back off for a second. We want to get this back onto the same ridge where it was originally. And you'll, you'll feel it when it's on there, right? Because if you go too far, you can feel it going past that. So if I, I should, maybe if I should take it off and show you inside here. All right, so you can see inside. I don't know if you can see. I might need to get a flashlight. This is all smooth. Hopefully you can see that if we zoom in on that. It's just completely smooth. And so these ridges here are, are meant to help cut into that plastic when we tighten down the clamp, right? So we just want to get it so that it's centered along these bands here. Right, so right like that, because you've got this outer ridge that marks the end of this, just like it does down here. Right, and then what we want to do is we want to rotate this guy around. And you want to channel your inner OCD, because you want to make sure this is perfectly on there all the way around, so you don't want it crooked. 
You can't get the clamp crooked because it sits in a groove. But you also don't want to get the boot crooked. And then just personal preference, I like to line them up the same here and there. Again, just trying to make sure that we have it just right. Because if we don't have it lined up there, it won't be lined up on the large one. And then we're going to take our crimping tool. And again, this is one of those things where you want to check two, three, four, five times before you do it to make sure that it's in the right position. And then as we crimp this clamp, if you look down here and zoom in, you can see what's happening with this clamp. You know what, guys? I'm going to get a flashlight because I can tell you can't see that. I want to make sure you can actually see what's going on with this tool as we crimp that clamp down. Because what's going to happen is it's going to squeeze around the outer perimeter at the same time that it lifts up around where the tool is grabbing it and pulling it off. All right, here's our flashlight. I think we'll be able to just pop it right on top of the vise here. Maybe at this kind of angle, we'll find an angle that works. Let's try that. How does that look on camera? Maybe that's a little better. Yep, I can see that. All right, I'm just going to squeeze it a little bit here. Again, I'm constantly checking to see if I've got it on straight. Now we're just going to kind of two-hand it the rest of the way. You can see what happens as you crimp it. This bottom piece of metal slides under this outer piece of metal. And as we keep doing that, it's going to get closer and closer and closer. And then what we're going to do is take our micrometer. And just like we see on the outer one that's down here, we're going to be aiming to get our crimp gap up here to just 2.15 millimeters. All right? It's not no more rocket science than that. Just want to keep lining up the tool. Now, the reason you want to use a tool like this, and maybe if I slide it this way, you can see there's like a foot on this tool. And as we squeeze it, that foot's going to the middle of that piece in, the, in there. If you try to use a pair of like wire cutters or something, you're going to end up probably just cutting it or it's not going to be straight. The thing is, it's really hard to do with just your hands. What I'm probably going to do is get a couple of uh, you know, breaker bars that stick in here, and which is why these cutouts are there like that. A couple of wrenches, just like you saw in the service manual, so that we can get enough force to close that gap to 2.15, right? So I'm not necessarily gonna show that, right? I'm just gonna try to give you an idea of what you need to do and you know, why the tool is set up the way it is. We're gonna go ahead and close that up though, and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll actually we'll go ahead and do this now. Let me show you a little bit about this. So we've got this guy all cleaned out. Right, we've used mineral spirits, and what we're looking for here is we've gone through on all these wear surfaces. Now, this, this particular axle's got, a, got, got at least 170,000 miles on it, I think, um, if not a little more. So you're going to have some wear, but you don't want to feel that wear. No gouges, no cuts, no corrosion, no pitting, any of that, and it's junk. It goes to the scrap metal. As long as it's nice and smooth, and then if you look inside, it's all nice and clean then you're okay. And we can take our other parts now that we've cleaned up here, right? So we've got our inner race, we've got our outer race, we've got our six balls. Uh, in the case of this GM one, these little marks here tell me that this is like the top. And I can come and line this up like this. Right, so now we've got our inner race in there. Or excuse me, our outer race. The inner race is easier, right? Because this is the place where your snap ring goes. So you know this is the bottom. And this is the top. Now this guy, he kind of goes in like that. And then he turns over, right? So now we've got the races installed. And now we need to put our snap ring in. Like everything else with these kind of projects, there are always parts that want to walk away and go for their own little trip. 
or that I forget to bring over when we're in the middle of trying to film and show you guys. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and cut the bag on our snap ring. All right, and so there's, this is, there's no specific you know, position for this guy. He's just gonna sit in here. I don't know if I can see to do what I need to do here. There it goes. All right, so he's in position now, right? And when we open him up, he will fit into this groove under the pressure of the axle shaft being in there. All right, so now what we want to do is put these balls in, right? So we need to position the races in the correct orientation to take the balls. Now, just like the other things, like I guess I didn't show it, right? We have looked at the wear surface on each one of these to verify that there's no pitting, no gouging, no damage whatsoever. Similarly, we've done the same thing with each of these balls. And by the way, you don't want to drop these balls. I mean, just dropping them from a height might be enough to put a little nick or All right, damage. so now we're just going to roll the two races back, inner and outer, and put the first ball into the outer race. And take our punch, gently work it down until we get the one on the other side. We're going to have a trouble. We're going to have the trouble where the inner race is going to want to walk on us. So to get around that problem, I'm going to be periodically pulling back with this other punch to keep it where we want it until we can get the ball on the other side in. Once we can get two of them in, the others should go pretty easy. All right, so we're going to put this guy here. And you're going to have a helper hold that. And what you're going to do, that's just going to hold the outer race while we tap the inner race back where it's supposed to be. All right. Try to work this guy down again. You just want to get him up enough to get the ball in there. There we go. All right, now we've got those two in, and what we'll work on now is each other opposing pair until we get the other four in. At that point, they'll all be in position, right? The ball's got to rate, sit in the uh, machining that it has here, as well as the inner race, and then it's got to be held by the cage itself, right? So you got an inner race, the cage, the outer race, and all of it together has got to be perfectly balanced. And if you get it just right, like we have here, you know, then everything can turn freely, even with no lubrication, right? I'm able to move all this with just my fingers. Once we put the grease in there, you know, one finger, it should move just like that. One finger this direction, one finger in this direction, right? It shouldn't need any lubrication to move freely. If there's any binding, you know, then you want to check and see, you know, do you have it maybe not centered right. Maybe these two aren't in. You want to get those two right before you do the others. All right, I'm going to put the other four in and we'll come back. All right, back. guys, just let me show you real quick what I was talking about for the final crimping with this tool on the, on the front clamp of the boot. So you can see this tool, they all should be kind of similar, right? The handles are leveled and this middle piece is offset. And what you can do is you can come in here and put a half inch breaker bar into the one side. Okay, and then on the opposing side, you can stick your torque wrench, half inch. Just kind of get it to where you want it to be at an angle. Set it for 100 foot-pounds, and then what you can do, you put this guy up on a block 
I've already crimped this guy, right? But you get the idea here. You would come down and, and, and close it with enough force at 100 foot-pounds in order to get the desired crimp value of spacing that you want for the gap. Okay, let's go take a look at the rest of it. All right, guys, now we're going to put the swage clamp on the large end of the boot, like so. We're getting that ready to install. So at that point, we're almost ready. Now we've got all of our balls into our outer race assembly. So inner race, cage, balls, and outer race all in position. You can see I can still move this by hand. You know, I did put a very small film of Luber plate on here just to make sure everything was seated properly. You know, when I first got the last two balls in, it wasn't quite that flexible. So I just took a, a very large brass punch and I just worked this guy around until the one ball that was not quite in the position it needed to be in settled himself in so that we could get this kind of ease of use. Now it's got more resistance than when there were two, but you should still be able to have this level of nice smooth movement. You know, you shouldn't feel any binding. You shouldn't feel any, um, you know, roughness or ridges or you shouldn't hear any kind of grinding sounds, right? You should just feel smooth ball bearing operation. So at this point, it's time to uh, put our grease in here. And this is a pre-measured packet. And you want to try to use all of it as much as you can. What I like to do is get a lot of it squeezed away from the top so we can cut uh, a little piece so we can have an exit for this stuff. You're not going to get every drop out right, but you get the idea. Just going to grab our scissors, going to cut a corner off like that. And then what we're going to be interested in doing first is I'm going to want to come down and squeeze this into the outer race areas. Get it on each one of these balls. We're going to end up using as much of this as we can get out. And sometimes when you move the sky, you know, all the way at an angle, you can get kind of wedged in. You got to get two fingers. That's also perfectly normal. You can see we're just kind of squeezing it in to make sure we're covering up the ball on each one of these. And then what I'm going to do after I get all of these guys, I'm going to come around on the inside of the inner race Right, I'm going to do the same thing where we're coming in here and we're filling in the cavities where the balls are sitting, right? And I got this guy right here. Right, and then we're going to do our punch real quick and we're going to make sure we get all that worked around. And the next thing that we're going to be doing is filling it up down in the bottom, right down through where the shaft is going to go into the snap ring. Now we definitely want to get this uh, deep down there so that we don't obscure our uh, snap ring. It's kind of like, you know, squeezing out the frosting on a cake. You might even have to get a little tool to, to help push it in there. But we want to use up about half of this, right, right about to here. Get all of this in underneath there. And then what we're going to do with the last bit is when we bring the top piece down, we're going to end up pushing it up along the edge right as we engage the snap ring. So let me go ahead and get the rest of that done. All right, guys, we've emptied our grease bag, you know, as best that we can. You know, kind of like there's a technique here where you can kind of get the last few drops out by doing this. Right, just to try and make sure that you do get it all in there. 
And then what I've done here up on top, we've kind of gooped it all on around here. I've left a piece open so that you guys can see the snap ring. And then we've put the rest right up in the top of the boot area around the axle. This stuff will all get shifted around where it needs to be by centrifugal force anyway while you're driving. All right, so the top of this axle shaft here you can see is beveled. And the purpose of that beveling is when we put this in with enough force here that we're going to expand our snap ring, which we can see right here, right? So that's the purpose of why it's shaped like that. So by having it in the vise, having gravity on our side, that should be all we need to do. Now we can see that we did have one mishap with the grease. Oh well, clean that up later. Get that off my hand so I get a good grip on this. This is the hard part, is to get it to go in. All right. I just felt it click, and that's what you're going to want to hear, is that click. I don't know if it was audible on the film, but that's the part that we were after. We're just going to clean this little bit of overspill up here. This is another reason why you want to try to get every bit of it in there in case you have a situation like this where you lose some of it. All right. Now for the last couple of checks, what I want to do is, again, we're just going to hold the boot at the bottom so it doesn't pop off. And what we're doing is we're just trying to make sure that it feels like we've got full range of movement and we don't hear anything unusual, we shouldn't hear anything, quite frankly, with all that grease in there at this point. And kind of just rotate it around. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the base of the outer um, race assembly and hold the boot. And then I'm going to lift up and down. I want to make sure I hear the shaft moving with that snap ring in the groove. All right, at this point, we're ready to uh, crimp this guy down, this swage clamp. And so let me go show you that. All right, guys, and this is the instruction sheet that came with the kit, right? And it's really just a, a duplication of what we already talked about in the service manual. But what we're mostly interested in, right, so we talked about doing this particular clamp. But what we really want to talk about now is the swage clamp on the rear. And that has to be uh, because it doesn't have a crimp. It's a compression-type swage clamp. It needs to go in this specific tool to close down on it. And, uh, there's, you know, this is the GM numbers, right? But, you know, there can be other aftermarket types. K10 is the 80s version of a K1500. And, of course, K20, 80s version of a K25. And K30 is 80s version of a K3500. Uh, the way I'd tell you to read this, reflecting trucks in the 90s, is use the dash 1 if you got 6 lug nuts. Use the dash 2 if you got 8, right? Because you're going to have a 1500 truck with diesel, but it's going to have all the same hardware including this axle shaft, is a K2500. And so we get this jig in the vise. It's got a piece that holds the axle, and then it's got two pieces that squeeze down and close on this swage clamp, and we get a setup like we've got right here. And so all we're going to do is tighten these uh, bolts down on this particular tool, which are 24 millimeter. And the way the instructions call for is we're just going to do 180 at a time on both sides. I'm probably going to do even a little bit less just so my arm's not in the way. But if we take a look at it from the rear, you know, we can see we've got a gap here and a gap here. But if we look down in the middle here, we can see that the tool is directly lined up on the metal swage clamp. That's the important thing. You don't want it on the outer race casting. You don't want it on the rubber boot. You want these two inner biting surfaces on the clamp itself. And then the key thing is just to tighten it down evenly, right? So we're just going to go on each side evenly. And if we look on the back side, we can see how this gap is closing. And 
That's all you do to it, right? And as soon as this bottoms out, you're done. Assuming that you lined it up properly, of course. And all I'm doing is I'm watching these gaps here, make sure that I keep them even all the way around as I go. And then once we bottom this guy out, then we'll just take it apart and we're ready to reinstall this on the truck. All right, so that side is fully bottomed. Now you want to put uh, anti-seize on the teeth of these bolts for this tool, but that's it. At this point, that swage clamp has been compressed around that boot and holding it onto the grooves of the casting of the outer race in a very similar fashion as this type of crimp version clamp. It's just a different design. All right, so at this point, we can take it out of the vise and put it back on the truck. All right, guys, we're just going to finish up running a wire brush around this thing so that we can get the corrosion problem a little better. Mostly around this inside piece. And then we're going to give it a coating of uh, luber plate, right? Super lube, luber plate, fluid film, something like that is what you'll want to use. So that we don't have, that corrosion is bad, hopefully the next time we need to come in here. And then we're going to come up with our shaft. It's a little heavy to do this. You can see we're going to come through the front here. And then we're going to need to come through with the axle nut on the end here. We're going to need to get it enough so we can pull the axle nut on. That'll let us bring it out enough then to get it on the flange back here. All right, guys, we've got this hand tightened on so we can pull it in far enough. So now we're going to come in the back now. We just want to, hopefully this light's in a good position. We just want to work this guy back onto the front of the flange plate. <laughs> like so. And then we want to get one of our nuts started, or excuse me, one of our bolts started by hand. And then we can turn it around and get the others in. Like maybe the one right on the opposite side is probably a good candidate. Right there. And then we're just going to go ahead and tighten these in. And then we'll come back and torque them. Just going to keep going like that, right? So two opposing sides. And then... Uh, Either one of these you can grab, then the opposing side, and just keep going until you have them both all back on. All right, we've got it all wrapped up, guys. You're going to do 165 foot-pounds on this axle nut. You're going to drop yourself a punch or a drift into the veins of the rotor against the caliper so that you'll be able to do that. You'll also need to do that alternatingly with the 15-millimeter bolts that are holding the shaft flange back here. And those 15s are 58 foot-pounds. We've got our uh, differential carrier shield, our skid plate back on. And those 15 millimeter bolts, the four of those down there, this aluminum guy, are 24 foot-pounds. We've got our stabilizer link reinstalled. We're not going to torque that until we get the vehicle on its own weight. When we do, we're going to torque this guy to 13 foot-pounds. So that is it. We've got our 
job done. And that is how you do an outer constant velocity joint reboot kit on a GMT 400 type truck. And it also applies to some newer trucks. I'll run the years these parts cover. If you've got questions, or you want to talk about how you've done this differently, go ahead and leave a comment below. I will tell you that, you know, the reason I would do a reboot on a on a uh, axle like this is I would tell you that an original GM axle from the 90s, if it's still serviceable, and we talked about how to determine that, is, is going to be way better than anything aftermarket. The aftermarket stuff is just, as far as I'm concerned, is scrap iron. But if you get the GM parts on a chassis component, it's going to last much longer than anything you'd pick up aftermarket. So that's why I only use GM parts for things like ball joints, axles, tie rods, hubs, rotors, um, any of this kind of uh, suspension equipment is, is just got to be OEM. If you found this useful, please think about subscribing and hit that like button. Helps find the helps the video get found out there on YouTube. Thanks for watching.